Welcome back to Austin P. State University's theater appreciation class. My name is Emily Seal and we are moving on to chapter 10, which is a chapter dedicated solely to creativity. And um, it's a really interesting uh, look at how creative people live and um, also how you can foster greater creativity for yourself. So um, I would like to supplement today's lecture. It's going to be pretty short with a Ken Robinson's talk. It's about 20 minutes. It's at the TED Talk website. Uh, you can see a link there below. TED is the Technology Education Design Conference where great minds come together to talk about great ideas. And Ken Robinson works particularly a lot with education and how to foster education uh, creativity. So. I hope you enjoy that talk. I think he's pretty funny and he has a lot to say. So pause this, go watch his lecture real quick and come back if you haven't already watched it. Creativity is, according to your book, um, it's someone who invents something, transforms something extant, uh, thereby adding value. So it's not just someone who can come up with things or ideas, but someone that can come up uh, with ideas that have meaning or can um, enhance our quality of life, uh, not just meaningless ideas. So if you turn over to the back of the chapter on page 231, you can see Ken Robinson's, Sir Ken Robinson's uh, definition. Um, originality, creativity is imagination. It advances, changes, or improves an individual society or humanity. So today we'll be talking about people not just in the theater, but in the sciences and in other arts that have used their creative talent to better our society. So let's start with just a history of inspiration or creativity, and this is something that's not necessarily in your book. Um, this is a Shakespeare line, the opening scene of Henry V. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. And what they're saying for is, oh, for an inspiration that would um, come to us supernaturally and make this moment magical. Uh, in the ancient Grecian times, uh, they believed, everyone in that culture believed that the divine spirit or the daemon would come and inhabit a person and then leave. Um, in the Roman times they actually believed that those lived in the walls and they called them geniuses, uh, that a genius would come and sort of inhabit you. And the best part about this theory was then you weren't completely responsible for your invention or your creation. There was an element of the supernatural to it um, that could kind of take credit. So uh, Sophocles, uh, fam I mean not Sophocles, Socrates famously claimed to have had a daemon or a muse as they would later kind of identify it. So, you know, how you came up with these great ideas was something outside of yourself. So you couldn't take all the blame and you couldn't also take all of the credit. Um, this is also a belief in um, Africa. Uh, when the Spanish came to Africa, they were dancing around their tribal uh, fires and they heard them say Allah Allah, which in Africa means uh, God and they would be clapping and they would chant Allah 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 and um, that meant that they felt like that they were in the midst of something magical that a, a single dancer was inhabited by God and that creativity that spark that twinkle in their eye was something supernatural and then the Spaniards took it back to their native countries which is where the term uh, ole comes from if you've ever been to a Spanish bull a uh, fight you've heard, ole, ole, uh, same general hurrah kind of feeling. And I don't know if you've ever kind of been in a situation where you have felt um, like what was happening, the inspiration that someone was feeling was almost divine, was something um, outside of themselves. I know a lot of us artists definitely feel this way, that something that our moments of genius when we think of something funny to say or when we write something beautiful uh, that it was something 
outside of ourselves, almost inhabiting us and uh, using us as just a vessel of that creativity. But it can also be a bit dangerous. Um, after you've created something genius, uh, it can kind of way heavy on you. Uh, this is a picture of Kurt Cobain and he like many many artists has been subject uh, of great psychological distress to the point of suicide. If you look at almost all of the great writers, uh, playwrights or otherwise poets, many many of them either succumb to alcoholism or suicide or drug abuse to the point of suicide or reckless behavior in general. Um, after you create something truly wonderful, uh, there comes with it the expectation of genius. You know, in this way, maybe the ancient Grecians had it right because you could sort of, you know, enjoy that moment of genius and say, well, that wasn't my ego or this not all reliant on me now to create more genius. I heard it interesting. TED talk from the author of Eat, Pray, Love, and she's just kind of sharing the weight of having a best-selling book and how um, she just knew that every book she writes after Eat, Pray, Love is going to be, you know, the book that was after Eat, Pray, Love, and how kind of daunting it can be to have moments of genius or creativity. You know, and, and creativity comes to people at different times and in different ways. Uh, you know, those original ideas sometimes could be associated with some kind of mental illness. Some people say that Vincent Van Gogh had his um, strokes of genius from actually having physical strokes. He had a lobe disorder that gave him strokes. <laughs> um, and so sometimes the quirky genius um, is associated with mental illness. I definitely see that in Alice in Wonderland with Lewis Carroll. You know, he was obviously deeply troubled. He was an insomniac. He didn't get along well with other people, and he thought in a way that was outside of the box. It was inventive, uh, but that may have also come with a lack of emotional intelligence. So, just kind of a few thoughts on what creativity is. So there's a supplement in your book on page 222, and I did study this when I was teaching high school and was prepping to teach high school for my uh, certification, and that was multiple intelligences. And I found a lot of comfort in this theory, as I know many people do. Um, Howard Gardner is a professor at Harvard uh, School of Education. He's a psychologist, and he was able to find in our brain that different parts of our brain uh, light up when different kinds of activities are engaged in. And that kind of came to a proof in the 1980s that different intelligences happen for different people. So uh, before the 1980s, there was like kind of a generic IQ quotient. And you would take your IQ test and they would say how smart you were across the line. You're either smart or you're dumb. Um, but what we kind of all know intuitively or have experienced in our everyday life is that we may be really good at drawing, but we, we might be really bad at math. And so intelligence isn't something that just comes in one across the board utility. You can be smart in one area and not smart in other areas. So another thing that makes this particularly useful is once you figure out where how your brain is wired or what you are sort of built to how you're built to learn you can use that in order to tap into those modalities when you're learning so for example I learned that I have um, a kinesthetic or I'm body smart so if I can think about doing it or teaching it myself if I can bring it down to the real world I can often learn something better I've also learned that I'm um, uh, picture smart or I have spatial intelligence and so I draw a lot of pictures even as I'm lecturing now it from the textbook I have all these little drawings that I've drawn out in the side of the margins and I've learned that that helps me to digest information to make things into pictures because that's the way that my brain thinks so if you've never taken one of these multiple intelligences tests I highly recommend them I think that it can really help you to know yourself in the way that you think and the way that you learn so I'm gonna take just a moment to kind of walk you through these they're pretty um, pretty uh, cut and dry transparent but um, 
it's worth going over and thinking about for yourself and I love the example and that uh, our speaker uh, gave us in the last lecture that I gave you a link to Sir Ken Robinson about a dancer who wasn't good at sitting still and doing your homework because uh, I definitely see this in various of my students that I've worked with. So the first one is a pretty traditional intelligence which is an ability to use words, being word smart or linguistically uh, gifted. Um, you have an ability, a facility with words and language to arrange them, to hear them in a way that makes sense and uh, is beautiful. So then here's another pretty traditional intelligence that we would think of and that's the logical or the mathematical. You can see patterns, you see the relationships between different parts of a whole, you're good at puzzles maybe. Um, uh, you can see the chaos and then create order out of it. So you hear the logic or you hear the math in things. Um, spatial reasoning, that's picture smart. We're working our way around the circle. We're to the green pie, if you haven't already noticed. Um, spatial intelligence is um, a great for coaches or architects, people who need to make um, mental graphs kind of thing. Uh, you can read maps, you can create diagrams, uh, you think in pictures. So that visual recognition, which is part of the reason in all of my PowerPoints that I like to use lots of pictures because I am a spatial thinker and when I'm doing a recall on an exam or something, if I can think of the pictures sometimes that will help me. So that's just an example of how I'm guilty of catering to my own intelligence. Part of the problem of what Howard Gardner talks about is that different instructors cater to their own intelligence. So if you're in my class and you're a mathematical thinker, I'm sorry. <laughs> like you're just going to have a hard time following my train of thought because that's not how I think. Whereas um, other instructors who are really into textbooks or language or written word, they're linguistic intelligent, they're going to give you an assigned reading and assume that you're great at uh, digesting that information. So it's a challenge. Howard Gardner also challenges us as teachers to try to tap into multiple modalities to take people on hikes to let them talk about it with a friend so that they can uh, digest the information in the way that makes them uh, most comfortable. He would really like to see all schools have a various of activities and where students learn to teach themselves. So, But I digress. Moving on. Um, bodily kinesthetic, right? Body smart. Uh, Hand-eye coordination. Um, your body's activities, uh, your capability to dance. Um, how in tune are you with your own body? Uh, this one is probably the most surprising for a lot of people that this is an actual intelligence because a lot of people think of it as a skill or something outside but it really is if you have a stroke and part of your brain is injured right then that um, bodily intelligence goes down. So motor movements, uh, your ability to move your body. Um, and that can also have to do with a real world uh, understanding, your ability to negotiate in the real world. Uh, musical intelligence, once again this one is pretty straightforward. Do you have a sense of rhythm? Do you have a melody or harmony? I had a friend, uh, she had a two-year-old who after he heard a melody once he could instantly um, memorize it. He could sing songs that he had only heard a couple times. Uh, he just had an amazing aptitude for music that was really outstanding. Uh, you know, people who are just born with a good ear and they can hear things and hear what sounds good and that is a musical intelligence. And then the last one is one that they lump together in our book, but they have it here as two separate things, is people smart and self smart. So um, how are you at interpersonal r relationships? Are you good at ability to read people? Um, very famously, Howard Gardner worked with students with Asperger's and um, autism, and they obviously uh, aren't good at reading personal cues and don't always care what other people are seeing or feeling. Um, and so he, uh, that was really one of the things that got him started thinking about these multiple intelligences. So your ability to deal, to know yourself and know your own thoughts and then your ability to deal with other people 
uh, would be your personal intelligence. So, um, and it's important to note that in your book, uh, they say also that your overall IQ doesn't make you any more creative, right? So just because you're smart doesn't necessarily mean you're good at generating ideas or dealing with people. <laughs> um, in fact, sometimes it's the opposite of that. Uh, so don't be discouraged if you're bad at math, um, but you're good at shooting a basketball, that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that you're stupid. And we as educators have kind of dropped the ball on teaching how different people have gifts and talents and intelligences. And um, creativity is open to all people, no matter what your intelligence is. Some of the kinds of creativity that we talk about today will be easier for some of you because of your intelligence. So if you are naturally a logical person, you may be able to stick two things together that we wouldn't usually think of. You may see mashups in your mind that, the, that other people may not see because that is your intelligence. Moving on, um, as I said, creativity, uh, creativity isn't just for the elite. It's not just for the artists. It's not just for um, geniuses. Creativity is something that we use in our everyday life. I love watching my little nephew play and see what he turns a bottle or a box into. Uh, right now, he's kind of a one note guy. Everything is a sword. It doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> He's obsessed with swords right now. But as children, we do this. We um, see things in a new light and we imagine things to be greater what they are. I like the example in your book about a guy <laughs> slicing his cheese with his credit card, kind of pulling a MacGyver there. I have a friend and she works uh, at a big plant um, and she fixes machines with very limited um, tools and so every day it's kind of like a creative chance for her to fix her line uh, with what she has and so she's always coming up with new techniques and new ideas original ideas and she gets paid a lot of money to be an engineer and do what she does uh, because she can think outside the box and she can work with her um, small resources she has uh, around her. So no matter what job you go into, there's a good chance that creativity will play a part in that role, especially because you're being college educated. You know, if you were going to just work on a line somewhere, then um, you may not use your creativity as much. But for a lot of you who are going to go into management, you're going to go into uh, real world situations where you're hired as a person who can think. That's your special skill. You got through college and you can think. So you're going to be the problem solver in your situation. And you need to learn to flex that muscle. Creativity is a muscle just like anything else. The different parts of your brain, the more that you exercise them, the more that you build that skill for yourself. So um, creativity versus Technique. So a lot of people kind of like to think of artistry as something that's sort of inspirational whim that kind of hits you or you have the skill or talent for it. But a lot of us in the arts, particularly in theory, uh, theater, we have techniques or methodologies so that we can have consistent performances, right? Um, when I was playing basketball in sixth grade, uh, I was a pretty good shot because I was tall for my age so comparatively I, I could shoot a basketball but the thing that I figured out is that I would just do it different every time and until my dad sat me down and taught me how to balance the basketball in my hand how to follow through with my arm I really wasn't having consistent uh, technique at shooting particularly from the foul line right but after he taught me to square my hips and uh, follow through with my arm I learned the techniques that made me better at shooting basketball and the same can be uh, said for actors you know we talked about techniques like emotional recall where you think of something um, that happened from your personal life a memory a sense memory and then create tears if I were just relying on myself to be hit with inspiration every night um, it would be highly stressful. Um, the technical expertise and cr teaching yourself technique um, and there still can be an element of creativity involved but it, it needs to be consistent right in order for you to put out good art you need to put your nose to the grindstone as it were which is just kind of a 
theme of all of today is um, you know building technique in order to create artistry it takes a lot of work um, so talent something that comes naturally to us um, you know Mozart is often considered sort of this icon of talent because he was at age eight already playing these beautiful compositions and writing music but most of what he wrote that was actually um, useful and reused was after he was older and he was put into an environment where he was productive and making and writing music so even though he was born with a genetic makeup that made him a good a musician he was also fostered by his environment he was taught by people who wanted him to do well um, you know some people would ask is it nature or is it nurture and uh, I agree with the book and saying that it's often both um, talent we're learning more and more is genetic you know some people have a predisposition um, you know, I listened to an NPR interview recently that was talking about pitchers and for professional baseball and the the ability to read visual cues of a batter before and as he steps up to a plate. Um, you know, some things are innate in our bodies and something that we already have, but it's also something that even if you do have talent, it needs to be fostered by certain environments right now what is an environment um, that fosters creativity and this is something that there's a lot of speculation about um, one thing that I would say is an environment where you feel free to be playful and have a good time and get in touch with your childlike self uh, uh, playfulness or an ability to play and amuse yourself is a great way to start with creativity um, usually the things that other people enjoy are going to be the things that we ourselves enjoy um, so some marks of a creative people according to this Harvard University study is someone who is curious they don't just accept what people tell them or the d textbook definition of things they ask questions they dissect things they want to see it for themselves they get their hands dirty um, I love that Alice in Wonderland line about curiouser and curiouser and how she just keeps sort of snooping about uh, even where she's not invited or wanted um, because I do think that people who are creative kind of have this itching or as Rudyard Kipling would call it an insatiable curiosity uh, they're never truly satisfied with the reality as it is explained to them they have to pry and dig and uh, ask more questions concentration is a big key to being productive as a creative person I know so many people in the creative circles who have great ideas that they don't follow through on they can't sit and concentrate and finish um, because ultimately if you're gonna have one success you have to have a thousand failures um, you know uh, I have a picture here of um, Albert Einstein because you know he had 248 publications right um, we're really only familiar with a few of his of course but you know Shakespeare had 37 plays and I, you know have you ever read Love's Labor's Lost no hopefully you haven't been forced to sit through that grueling and agonizing horrible play <laughs> because even people who we would consider genius or creative uh, you know savants have failures and they um, have to just keep their nose to the grindstone and keep working and working and working um, they have a, an example here of Sir Isaac Newton and how he would forget that he had visitors at his banquet table because he would get a flash of idea or inspiration and he would just go away to write it really quick and he's a good example of someone who felt the weight of their genius because he did have an emotional breakdown and had to 
uh, resign from court. Even back then, you know, it wasn't just the fame or the fortune that sometimes people think creative people suffer from. It's also just the expectations that you put on yourself of never being satisfied and just having to bear down and focus on, and work and work and work until some good work comes out of that productivity. So creative people are people who are willing to actually work and put their nose to the grindstone and keep going. Um, I really like that quote about most of what a creative person's job is perspiration, um, <laughs> not inspiration. Yeah, Thomas Edison, creativity consists of 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. <laughs> I've definitely felt the pains of that. Um, so going back to those intelligences, um, creative people can sometimes put things together that regular people wouldn't or find an order or a structure where other people may not. The picture I have here is from Keizo Shimamoto and he is a chef in New York City who's got a very successful restaurant and he makes these ramen. He is Japanese and he makes these ramen buns and uh, you know some people just see the world differently they find an order they think outside of the structure that other people do and they dare to make something different from that and it's um, very inspiring I hope you're inspired to go make something different for your next meal <laughs> have fun with it I remember when I was in junior high I used to love to put peanut butter on pickles, so I might have to go buy some pickles from the store just to exercise my genius. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so uh, creative people also tend to uh, have mental agility. They can um, generate new ideas. They can hunt for the solution until it's found. Um, they uh, have these options to their problems. They can think of new approaches. Um, uh, you know, and, and typically um, mental mobility uh, comes from just a willingness or an acceptance and an openness to kind of try new things and uh, think outside the box. So I have a, a picture here of Picasso and just as we said people create so much work um, you know there's a lot of failures that come with that. Um, Many of Pablo Picasso's work, works were considered medi mediocre. Um, you know, Thomas Edison said that he did 2004 experiments before he found the right filament for the electric light. So as an artist, you have to just be willing to, as we called it in my last department in my grad school, fail gloriously. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ideas that you may come up with where you say, this is either the most interesting and out there idea it's wonderful or it's absolute crap <laughs> and that's where a lot of um, artists live you know in that area of is this gonna work or it may just completely bomb um, but either way if you're a true artist you have to be willing to risk and willing to fail and willing to put yourself out on the line and make yourself vulnerable and uh, and take as many attempts as you can in order to get it right creative people know this and they aren't afraid to fail and this is one of the things that I think is um, kind of beat out of us in the public education system which we talk about in that lecture um, that you know if we keep testing as our primary mo modality to understand children and their intelligence um, we really are going to beat failure out of them because uh, you know they're penalized for failing so if they live in an environment where they can't risk it then they're more likely to become so averse to risk um, and, and that quotient so um, so the challenge for you is how do you become more creative? I, I hope I've inspired you to value creativity and I hope that you've seen that we're living in a world that's changing. We have data around us. It's no longer about collecting information or regurgitating multiple choice answers. We're getting into a world where we need to learn how to use that information to assemble and redo the way that we are currently doing things. We're living in a time of constant change. So I really challenge you to think about upping your creative life. And one of the first thing you can do is kind of um, change your surroundings. 
you know, avoid people who don't let you fail. Avoid people who aren't willing to chip in and build something with you and become part of the solution. Um, part of what is so amazing about William Shakespeare and the age that he lived in in Elizabethan England is there were so many fantastic writers. There were so many inventions happening in this golden age. Part of that was the financial and religious stability, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs <laughs> saying that these people were able to provide for themselves so now they can kind of join the higher order of thinking. Um, but also part of it is they were hanging out with people who were different than themselves. Uh, London was a port city where lots of trade was going on so they were meeting people from Italy they were meeting people from France and those cultures were then melting into a melt pot of uh, of thoughts and ideas which is part of what makes America so great that we have so many different kinds of ideas we're like a fusion of creative juices and so um, you know maybe hang out with someone different than you you know, don't always just try to find people who are exactly like you, but maybe, you know, hire people or work with people who have a different perspective. Maybe they're a different sex. Maybe they're a different uh, cultural identity and let those people inspire you to uh, think in a different way or something different from yourself. And that's part of what I really love about theater is you can kind of participate in a culture different from your own without even leaving your town. Because if you go to the theater and you see a different um, kind of play, different from the environment you live in, you kind of get to travel without leaving your town. <laughs> Another kind of key for you becoming more creative is not to say no to yourself so much. I don't know if you've seen this movie um, where Jim Carrey takes on the challenge to say yes and he works at a bank and he gives all these people loans and the bank is prospering because these people, once you put a little faith in them, have um, followed through and it's a very optimistic mu movie, admittedly so. But in improvisation, we talk about this, the ability to say yes and agree. Yes and. Um, so if we were in a scene together and, uh, you know, we start the scene and you say, hi mom, then instantly I as a person trying to build the scene with you would say, yes daughter, right? I agree with you that yes, I am your your mother. So we've established that about the scene. And then I say, and how dare you stay out so late last night? So then I've created part of the scenario and we're building together this scene and working together. And uh, a lot of people going into a boardroom or a workroom or even the war room, they're so fearful of making a mistake that they don't let other people really give a chance. They don't really listen to what other people are saying. So I want to challenge you uh, in your everyday life to try to give people the benefit of the doubt, to try to agree in as much as you can uh, before you say no and critically judge the idea. Give it a fair chance. Um, and a lot of the time that can come in your own instincts, right? Some of us are so used to um, fear and failure that we don't listen to our own inner voice and we've kind of stuffed it down that we don't even hear it anymore. Um, and so I want to challenge you when you have your own idea, when you have your own sort of impulse, just entertain the thought of going with it and seeing where it takes you. Uh, because you might be happier and have a more fulfilling life if you're listening to your own instincts. Um, another kind of thing that you need to ask yourself is, are you enjoying the journey, right? Is your motive to become rich and famous? Because if so, you may not ever feel fulfilled or you're going to lose sight of enjoying the journey along the way, right? Uh, I always ask my students that in rehearsal process. You know, they're not learning all their lines or they're um, not really applying themselves in rehearsal. And, and perfect practice equals um, a perfect performance. You know, practice doesn't necessarily make perfect. If you're practicing wrong, then you're only going to perform it wrong in the end. So um, the creative process is something that we really study a lot in grad school too. Your ability to kind of put your nose to the grindstone and enjoy the rehearsal process and enjoy the creative process, not just be so product oriented you know, be creative in the moment. And then if the process 
that the product, remember we've taken high stakes, we're trying to fail gloriously, if the product itself doesn't work out, you can say, well, at least we had a great time in the process. At least we value the process of what we did rather than the product. So assess your own motivation for why you're doing what you're doing and try to enjoy the journey and not just think of it in terms of what can I get out of it in the end, but what am I doing along the way to make it right. Um, I love dance improv. Uh, when I was in grad school, I love to go next door and just watch them be creative and enjoy the moment-to-moment -moment body exploration. Uh, it's so fun and this particular exercise is contact improv uh, which is just beautiful, beautiful way to enjoy a journey. Um, another thing is just to adjust your schedule, right? Are you leaving time in your life to let your mind wander? A lot of us go from job to job, uh, paycheck to paycheck, just scraping um, by and, and never let yourself incubate on ideas. In their textbook it talks about the three B's, the bathtub, the bed, and the bus. Uh, and you know, many a person has had a moment of inspiration while they're washing their hair uh, because it's a time when you can kind of let your mind uh, wander maybe as you're at a concert or you're um, you know trying to fall asleep those times when your mind is kind of distracted is a great time for you to kind of incubate on your ideas or let them kind of evolve and that's another reason why it's so important as you're working on these projects to give yourself plenty of time you know if you have to write a paper where you're writing a story, you know, start on it in the first day that, that your professor gives it to you and let it sort of work its way through your mental processes so that by the time you actually have to create it, your brain has had some time to sort of let it marinate, to let it incubate like a little chick under a warm light. Um, you know, that process and allowing plenty of time for the creativity to sort of move about and work itself out in your mind is is really important. So let yourself daydream. That's what I'm saying. Um, like everything in the world, doesn't it seem like every time I look up an ailment, they're like more sleep and exercise. Um, but it's true for creativity as well. You're not going to be as creative if you're not giving yourself enough sleep. If you're not um exercising and releasing those endorphins. He even talks about an endorphinergetic, I don't know how to say that, um, state where your creativity, once you get your blood flowing, um, is upped. So, as with everything else, get some sleep. Easier said than done for you in college, huh? Um, so, uh, this is probably nothing new to you. Uh, but when you're thinking about problem solving um, and hypothesizing, there's a specific process that you can go to uh, and that scientists have relied on for so many years. And the first is just to specify the problem. Take, for example, um, that you're not enjoying work, right? So some people can kind of throw up their hands and say, well, I guess I have to quit my job, you know. Um, but if you take the time to actually look and diagnose the situation, what exactly about this is going wrong? In communication theory, uh, this is a crucial step to conflict resolution. If you're having a repeated conflict with your husband, what exactly about the communication patterns that you're having is discouraging? right? Um, maybe he's always making jokes that are disguised truths, or maybe he's calling you a name that you don't like. Find that exact thing that's not working about the relationship rather than just, you know, going straight for a breakup. Um, once you've kind of got that problem, you can dissect it into different components. Some of what you may be able to do something about, other parts you may not. Um, but make it manageable. This is one of the hardest things for beginning theater artists to do because it can feel so overwhelming. What do you mean I have to have all those lines memorized by the time that the show opens? Uh, you know, take it act by act, scene by scene, day by day. You know, make a list uh, and, and cross things off as you go. Um, creating those bite-sized manageable pieces is a big part of being able to think critically. And a 
probably the biggest reason why people don't do well in online classes because they wait until the night before all of the test and, and try to watch everything in one day and kind of rush through it. Remember what I said about time being the enemy, enemy of thought and giving yourself plenty of time can um, lead to better critical thinking skills. Um, and so next we're going to come up with possible solutions. Right? Um, don't just rely on other people to fix it for you or throw up your hands. Um, the people who are hired to uh, you know, have college degrees and be able to think, you need to also be able to come up with ways to fix those problems. And brainstorming is part of what we said about allowing yourself to fail. Uh, it's not uncommon if I have an assignment or something to work on that I just sit down with a pen and pencil and write as many things as I can think of, some of which I know won't work, but just getting them on paper really helps me to see it from a different perspective. So um, you can edit after you brainstorm, but you know, take a moment to just be open to possible solutions. And then the biggest step is the end step, which is testing to see if the solution actually works. So this experimentation process isn't something that's uh, solely that of theater, but it's something that applies to your everyday life. So um, take, for example, an actor who just isn't getting into her part and she's kind of just reciting the lines. Um, so I might sit down as the director and work with that person and say, all right, where's the block? What's changing? How can we inspire your performance to have more uh, creativity? And uh, letting that person take some ownership and come up with solutions for themselves and then try new things on stage can lead me to a better performance. Uh, the uncreative person would be tempted just to let it go and do what it is, um, but I want to challenge you to not accept your life as it is, but to take a risk. Um, be creative. Put yourself out there, um, and, and you'll probably have better luck in the workplace if you do. Our education system isn't necessarily built to um, reward risk takers, but the real world is, so I hope that you'll dance, that you'll dare, that you'll put yourself um, in a position where you're trying new things and being creative. The best way to become creative is just to do it. Um, they did an international uh, test where they interviewed 5,000 people and it was surprising almost all of them valued creativity but only one in four believed they were actually creative. So I don't want you to just think of creativity as something that's important. I want you to also try it. Put yourself out there. Live a daring life. Fail gloriously and have fun with it. As always, thank you for listening.